Okay, uh, this is a bit of an extra lecture after the first week of the DSLs of math course, after some requests for more Haskell intro has come up. So I'll record a little bit uh, of implementing simple Haskell functions using type-driven development. So let's move over to Emacs. <clears throat> so by type-driven development, I mean using parametric, parametrically polymorphic types to guide the implementation of certain useful uh, standard functions. So I've chosen to implement some of the functions from the Haskell prelude, which are then hide, hidden here from the imports, so to avoid clashes. So I define my own variants of them. And we will start with some building blocks for functions. Functions are at the core of functional programming, and uh, it's important to get a feeling for these. Also in the DSL so math course, um, functions are also very important for mathematics, but function definitions in mathematics um, are sometimes not talked about as much syntactically as they are in, in this course. Okay, so the first function here is the identity function. And first, uh, there is the peculiarity with the type. So it says the type is A to A, but what is A? Well, A is just a name here of some unknown type. And you can read this as id has type for all A, A arrow A. So for example, id can be specialized to have type int arrow int. It also has type bool arrow bool, or something more complicated. It also has type int arrow bool to int arrow bool. You can apply the identity function to whatever you like, and you will get back the same thing, something of the same type at least. So that's the first question. What is A? Well, A is a type variable. Type variable which is unconstrained we can we have to um, unconstrained we have to implement the function in such a way that whatever we use for a it should work and that means there are not many choices actually okay so how do we implement id <clears throat> well the standard procedure for implementing a function is to invent a variable name let's call it call it hi so id of hi should be, have a right-hand side. And what type should the right-hand side have? Well, we know now that hi has type A, even though we don't know what A is. And the right-hand side, I just abbreviate right-hand side here, also needs to have type A. Well, fortunately, we have a value of type A in our hand, and that's hi. And we have no other value of type A, uh, well, no reasonable value at least, uh, and that means that id of high equals high is the only reasonable definition of the identity function. We can also define it syntactically in one other way. So if we have the same id again, or the same type of id, but we say call it id prime. And the, the other way is say, okay, let's just say inequality. Id prime is a value. And in Haskell, we have syntax for values of more complex types as well. So here, the syntax for a function as a value is a lambda expression. A lambda expression, let's write that here, lambda expression, um, means a special syntax for describing a function. And the special syntax is a backslash, which is an ASCII approximation of a lambda. And then a variable name, say x, minus greater than, so the same two characters as in the type signature, and then a value. So note here that x here is not at all the same as a. x is in the same position relative to, to this, but there is a lambda before it, and they are in different worlds. So x has type a. It's not, it's not equal to a. a is a type and x is the value of type A. Okay, but otherwise there is very little choice left if we have introduced a variable 
name x, we have to use it on the right hand side. That's the only value here in scope that we have of type A. Okay, so we have two equivalent definitions of identity function. And we can try it on something, we can try it. We said it, it should have type int to int, so if we call it with, a, with a, an int, we get an int back. If we call it with a boolean, like true, we get true back. And if you call it with a function from int to bool, say the function even, well, then we get a function back. So we can actually here say foo equals id even and then call foo on three. Well, id even is the same as even. So even of three is false and foo of four is true. So notice that we can apply id to lots of different things. In each case, it's a different instance, a different type instance of id. So the polymorphic function can be instantiated to different versions, int to int, bool to bool, or int to bool to int to bool. Okay, next function to implement is const. So a function here takes two arguments, a and b. Or rather, I should say, it takes two arguments, x of type a and y of type b. So a has type a and y has type b. <clears throat> then it has to return a value of type a. That means that even we have two values in scope, x and y, only one of them has the right type. The only choice here is to put x. If we load this one, it will type check. And if we try the other version, if we try to put y here instead, it will complain. This is not type checked, not type correct. So let's put back, um, save and put this one back. Okay, so now how can we try out this function? Well, it needs two arguments. So if I apply it to only one, say const one, it would just say, well, const one is still a function. Um, so if I apply it to two arguments, const one and two, then it will return the first. But if I now call bar is equal to const one, I can use bar to get rid of strings or um, booleans or uh, numbers. Whatever I apply bar to, it will always return one. So notice this example here, bar equals const one. Uh, is an example of applying the function const to only one argument. And it might look strange, but you can read the type in this way if you want. So const is a function from A returning a function from B to A. And that's the type of bar here, B to A, where A is uh, int. Okay, <clears throat> for const as well as for id, we can write it in a different way we can try to implement it with a lambda expression instead. So const prime is equal, and then a lambda expression. Let's use the same type names here. So x, and then it should return a function that takes y into, well, the only choice here is again x. You can see we lined it up. So x is type a, y is type b, and we return x of type a. So even though, though we have type, we have variables here, uh, these are value variables and these are type variables. And the type variables live after the double colon in the type world and the normal value variables live in the normal Haskell value world, expression syntax. So let's, uh, oops, sorry, uh, let's try this out. Uh, can we use const prime in a similar way? Well, const prime high is a function from any B to a list of characters. So for example, high there is just high or high five. Well, let's put it high five is just high. And as before, we can also apply it to more strange things like const high and id. It will completely ignore the second argument, including if it's uh, an error. 
you will return the string hi and not the error ho. Oh, sorry, this was still testing const. I should test const prime, but it will give the same result. Okay, function composition. This is the rather complicated looking type of function composition, but let's look at an example first. So we have two test functions, f1, that takes an integer to a boolean, we've implemented here as even, and f2, which takes a double to an int, implemented as rounding, and then we want to combine them to a function that goes all the way from the double to the bool. Check if the nearest integer is even or not. And the function composition is intended to do this. It takes f2 and then combines it with f1. It stuck, sticks them together in the middle. So the int type is an internal value. Uh, that's the result after applying f2. But already, as soon as we've got it, we will apply f1 to it. So this is the intended use. Uh, we can uh, we can test f1 on 3. Point, no, sorry. Uh, f1 was the int bool one, so f1 of 3. We can use f1 on 3.2. And we can try to use f2 uh, on 3.2, but it will give an error because we haven't defined it yet. It's still defined as the error here. So um, when we define a function which is an infix operator, uh, or when we define a value which is an infix operator, we can give its two arguments on the left and right hand side of the operator. So just as for plus, uh, we can use here f and g. And this is now type correct and syntactically correct. And then it's a question, what should be the right hand side? Well, we can write right hand side here, but then we have to define it. Where right hand side equals. Well, actually, we we have to give some, let's put error to do here as well. Um, oops. Okay. <clears throat> so right-hand side, the type of right-hand side should be this. Right-hand side should have taken A and return a C. So it, Right hand side is a function. Let's give it an argument x. And if we actually, if we indent this one under the a, we can put it in such a way that we know that x is of type a. Okay, and how here we have to produce a value of type c. So what can we write instead of oh, to, to produce a value of type c? Well, let's see what we have in our hands. We've got f. And f is the first argument, so it has type b to c. Um, that could help us. So let's say we, we call f here. But what should we use as the argument to f? Well, let's call it um, hi. <laughs> and then we can make another where clause where we say hi is equal to. Well, what should hi be equal to? Hi should be a value. Let's let's put that in the comment here. Hi should be a value which can be when f can be applied to. F needs a b, so hi should have type b. Okay, what can we do to get a b? Well, actually we have more than just f here. We also have g, which takes an a to a b. So okay, so it seems reasonable to assume that we can apply g to some hmm, high ho. Now we're getting deep here. It's like dreams in dreams. Ho, we should define that one. And let's put the comments nearer to its definition. Highest type b, but ho needs to have type a. Why? Well, because g requires an a. So now, fortunately, we have a value. Let's put this here. We have a value x of type a in scope, because the right hand side was a function from a to c, which means its function argument x will be, I'll just unindent this one, the function argument x will be of type a. So 
well, ho is actually equal to x. That's the only reasonable choice here. So at this stage, we have a rather complicated looking expression. And uh, it also complains parse error on high. I need to indent this one more. OK, that's better. So this is getting a little bit out of hand with all the where statements. But let's first, before we try to simplify it, make sure that it actually works. So far, we only type checked it. We haven't tried it. So remember, we had f3 down here as a test function that should combine f1 and f2. So f3 applied to 3.2 should first round it and then apply even. Yes, it works. And uh, if we apply it to 3.8 instead, it would round it to 4 and get an even true number. OK, so let's see. How do we now simplify this expression a bit? Well, first of all, uh, let's ignore the type signatures. Ho is equal to x. And the nice thing with Haskell is that it is referentially transparent. Referentially transparent. Um, which means we are allowed to replace equals by equals. So if ho is equal to x, we can replace ho by x. We don't need ho. It's just another name. Let's put x there, and then we can erase this local bar clause. And we can go back and check that f3 on these different values still, still do the same thing. OK, so now if we um, look at Hi, well, hi is also a name. We can replace it by g of x, the definition of it. And then we just have to be a little bit careful. We can't just write this, because that would mean that f is applied to two arguments, g and x. We have to use the parentheses around this. So we have to be careful syntactically when we splice in a value that sometimes, if it is a complicated expression and not just a name, we have to add some parentheses. OK, now we have something that still can run these examples and give the same results as before. So finally, uh, we can also get rid of the right, right hand side here. But it's not obvious quite directly how to do it, because it says what right hand side applied to x is. It doesn't say what the right hand side is. So then let's do another transformation first, and that's between the syntax of function definitions with arguments, like here, and the lambda expressions we saw before. So we can move the x over to the right hand side and define our hs as lambda x arrow f of g of x. So this is still the same old function. It will do the same thing as before. But now we have a complete Haskell expression for right hand side. So the name right hand side isn't really needed anymore. The f compose g is right hand side, but this is actually replaceable by this. So finally, we have a definition of f compose g as just one value without any where clauses. But I'm not saying I don't, I don't mean that the where clauses were meaningless. It was a, a help to step by step try to find out uh, what types do we have and what should we do here? Um, and just checking this still type checks, we can actually go one step further and uh, move the lambda expression back to a function definition. And to do that, we need to introduce an extra set of parentheses here. So the function f compose g applied to x can be defined as f of g of x. So this is perhaps the most concise version of the definition of function composition. And yeah, just to make sure that it still works. Yes. OK, <clears throat> so what have we done? We have I then used type-driven development, parametric polymorphic functions, to guide the implementation of very simple functions, id, const, and composition. And we tried it out an example to see that it actually works as it should. Let's uh, move on to pairs after a little break.